Nuremberg, the judges enter to hear the case for the defense in the war crimes trial. On the witness stand is Hermann Willem Goering, leading living exponent of the Nazi philosophy and outstanding defendant among the score on trial. It is Goering's turn to testify and to answer the questions of Justice Robert Jackson, United States prosecutor. The courtroom is hushed. Hess, Ribbentrop, Stryker, and the others of the Hitler gang are tensely interested. In cross-examination, following Goering's 55,000-word prepared speech, Justice Jackson questions him. Well, if you wanted certain people killed, you had to have some organization that would kill them, didn't you? This, uh, uh, Rome and the rest of them were not killed by Hitler's own hands nor by yours, were they? Röhm, den, die Affäre Röhm habe ich hier deutlich ausgeführt. Das war ein Staatsnotakt. Well, I'm not asking. Und ist durch die Polizei durchgeführt worden. Yes, but when it was state necessity to kill somebody, you had to have somebody to do it, didn't you? Ja, wie in anderen Staaten auch, ob das nun Secret Service heißt oder woanders, weiß ich nicht. Goering's replies, like his carefully prepared full-length defense of Nazism, leaves no doubt of his loyalties, nor of his pride in the gigantic organization for aggression which Nazi Germany created. Suave and unabashed, he had already openly stated his support of all of Hitler's policies. His testimony completed, Goering joins his colleagues. They are pleased and to some extent relieved because he was forced to shoulder much responsibility himself. The man who still boasts of his leadership in Germany's war plans has had his day in court. The machinery of democratic justice proceeds. The Pacific Ocean on the rampage. Swift towering waves originating in the Aleutian Islands, spreading out for thousands of miles to batter shorelines from Hawaii to South America. One of the worst tidal waves on record takes its toll. It began when a fault under the ocean bottom caused a landslide. Then the bottom dropped. To fill the great hole, great masses of water rushed in. And all along the Pacific coast of North and South America, mammoth waves began to break. Hilo, once a peaceful Hawaiian resort city, bore the brunt of the disaster. The capital of the island of Hawaii was completely changed in a few hours. Today it resembles the battlefields of Okinawa or Guam. Thousands are homeless. Officials report that it will take a year to restore the city to normal. Homeless natives of the island are transported to new quarters as the United States Army assumes control. Thousands of refugees will be housed in barracks. Out of the strange and unpredictable shifting of the earth has come this freak disaster that battered the shores of two continents. Off the coast of Kyushu, southernmost of Japan's four main islands, nature again takes the spotlight. Ontaki, a volcano with a history that goes back 350 years, erupts into violence. The entire peninsula is evacuated as the volcano hurls rocks more than a thousand feet into the air. Three streams of molten lava pour down the mountainside. Waging a new war is man's oldest enemy, the terrible power of the Earth itself. At a Michigan General Hospital lives 45-year-old Horace Flinders, once a promising pianist who became utterly insane even incapable of walking or feeding himself. Now, through musical therapy, Flinders is fighting his way back from schizophrenia. Critics have called him a genius, but more important, he is recovering. Dr. Gruber, hospital superintendent, is trying, through music, to bring Flinders all the way back from his world of fantasy to the world of reality. Flinders plays Chopin's fantasy impromptu.
the village of Darton in France was destroyed on orders of the Nazis. Many of the town's inhabitants were lined up and shot in revenge for resistance activity. Now, in temporary wooden shelters on the edge of town, the people of Dorton have begun the long, hard task of reconstruction. Schools are functioning again, and craftsmen of the village have gone back to work. With the aid of prisoners of war, the walls of the shattered buildings are torn down to make way for a new village of Dorton. about the gigantic task of reconstruction. The United Nations Security Council meets again. A week of closed session since Russia refused to discuss the Iranian dispute and communication with the governments of both nations have brought a Soviet promise to unconditional withdrawal of her troops from Iran by May 6th. Secretary Burns presents a resolution. Resolved that the Council defer further proceedings on the Iranian appeal until May 6th, at which time the Soviet government and the Iranian government are requested to report to the Council whether the withdrawal of all Soviet troops from the whole of Iran has been completed, and at which time the Council shall, shall consider what, if any, further proceedings on the Iranian appeal are required. Sir Alexander Cadogan of the United Kingdom strongly backs the resolution. I, too, <coughs> support the resolution which is now before the Council. And I think that the Council must feel indebted to the Secretary of State, Mr. Burns, for the contribution which he has made, the valuable contribution which he has now made towards uh, reaching an arrangement. Dr. Kuo of China, chairman, calls for a vote. Australia's Hodgson abstains from voting, and Soviet delegate Gromyko has not yet returned to the Council table. The Security Council votes to adopt the proposal that ended the Iranian crisis for the time being. The Iranian delegate, Hussein Allah, addresses the Council. As this Supreme Tribunal, to whom we appealed for justice, has taken the view that the assurance given by the Soviet representative in his letter of yesterday to the Secretary General is a pledge that all Soviet troops will be evacuated unconditionally within a period of five or six weeks at latest by May 6, 1946, the people of Iran will likewise accept this pledge as such an unconditional assurance. The Security Council has overcome one obstacle and prepares to deal with the other matters on the agenda.